Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Grow Your Path to Wellness. Uh, my co-host and I, Kelsey, host an episode every week with a different wellness professional on a different topic. I have been on maternity leave uh, since August. No, October. Where am I? What's happening? Um, I have been on maternity leave for a few months here, but Kelsey is doing some self-care and traveling in on some islands, I'm pretty sure. Very jealous of her. So I'm covering this week and next week. Um, make sure that you always like, comment, subscribe uh, so that you know when the next episode is coming out. Last week, Kelsey, uh, welcome back our guest, uh, Will Mills from TikTok. And he talked all about the men's mental health and covered men's mental health series on toxic masculinity, while my husband is also on maternity leave for that series. So make sure you go back and check that out if you haven't already. This week, we're welcoming back one of our own, Jenna Sabago. She is going to be talking all about how to be more gender affirming in everyday life. Welcome back, Jenna. Hi. So Jenna, you were here before, and I think we did, did we do art? Therapy? Yeah. Yeah. We talked we about art therapy a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So can you, for those that don't know you, didn't listen to that episode, can you just give a brief intro? Who are you? What do you do? My name is Jenna. I do mental health counseling, art therapy, work through Coleman, which is a nonprofit agency, and then Carve Your Own Path, and providing um, a little bit of art, a little bit of expression to go along with the counseling. That way it's not just talk therapy, uh, bringing in different ways to use color or images or just scribbling out your anxieties to get through the day-to-day. -day. If Jenna and I weren't friends, I'd love to have an art therapy session with you just to know what it's like. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, so if you, I don't remember how long ago that was. We've been doing this podcast over a year now, um, so I can link it in the show notes of when that was, but make sure you go back and check out that episode because it was really great. But this time we are talking about gender. So starting off, uh, what is gender? We've had a couple different, um, not presenters, guests talk about gender and sexuality and sexual identity and gender identity before. Um, so we don't need too many details, but just some recaps. What is the definition of gender? Gender is basically characteristics and roles based on social norms. So what we're taught to do, what we see through other people. Um, but the issue always comes in of what is gender versus what is sex. Um, probably had some terms on that as well, which is when you're talking about sex, it's the physical differences, the natal sex, what you're born with, basically what assigned genitalia or internal chromosomes, external factors do you have um, that separate the gender from sex when you're talking about kind of the categories. <clears throat> Okay, so I just had a baby, mm -hmm. right? And so gender that I'm supposed to be marking on things per quote unquote, like per medical providers and paperwork I fill out and all these things is male because he mm -hmm. was born with a penis. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, we have decided to use uh, he, they pronouns for our new one. And it's just interesting because you don't know. How do you know? I don't know until they tell me what their right. gender is. Right. Yeah, so it's from beginning, and I mean, we're kind of taught that from birth. It's it's the gender reveals, which quote unquote can be the sex reveals because you don't know what gender reveal you're having until you get that ultrasound that shows were they born with a penis or not. Um, so that's determined by the anatomical markers, but then that puts into to space that gender is sex or sex is gender because then the gender is on the type of clothes, pink or green, the colors, um, pink or green, pink or blue. See? Well, then it's interesting too, well. like you don't realize something until you go through it yourself, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. it's just very, I don't know, I am who I am. So I find it odd how natural and normal it is to just be like a stranger. Mm -hmm. Oh, congratulations. What are you having? And to mm -hmm. me, I hear what sexual organs does your baby have? Does your baby have a penis or a vagina? And to me, that's weird. Why do we care? Right. right? right. And it's like, okay, so my 
child, whether I tell you that they are they have the sex parts of a female or a male, you're automatically determining some predetermined judgment of who they're going to be in this world. Like, why is that so important, right? Yep. Yeah, and then that it even makes it harder with, like, that focus on sex because that's on the binary because it's, you know, you're either one or the other, but then you have intersex that comes into play, which is any vast majority of any specific characteristics of male or female natal sex organs and autonomy, chromosomes, um, physical appearances, whether it be like specific attributes, um, penis, no penis, uh, penis and, you know, ovaries like seen or unseen as well. So it's like it even completely gets rid of that binary al already. But we don't ever talk about intersex as often. It's starting to get talked about more though. So people can go their whole lives not knowing, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't have obviously identifiable organs or things like that, like, right? It could just I be in their chromosome. So. Yeah. Um, I do not have all of the education on that. I'm still learning, but I feel like I've read or seen things that are like, had no idea or it was very minimal. And it was something they found out later in life. But then there's also the flip side of people. It's not as common as it used to be, but they would find out that they were actually pushed into one binary or the other because right from birth, there would be a medical procedure done that would either push them more into the male or the female side instead of having this ambiguity, I guess, of what sex they belong to. And it's interesting because the reasons for that are not medical. Mm -mm. They're social. Um, yeah. And I can go off on a tangent because, you know, circumcision to me is another one of those things. Like you just <laughs> like we just do it because we do it. Mm -hmm. But like medically, there's not a necessity to do that. It's a social thing. So even Tommy was like when he was gathering information and asking questions about circumcision was like, well, you know, I just don't want him to get, like, made fun of or bullied mm -hmm. if he's in the locker room with other guys or whatever. And I'm like, is that a reason to yeah. chop him up at birth, right? <laughs> so it's just interesting that we make these life-altering decisions for our children and people in general. Put them under the knife, and it could be irreversible. And yes. now someone's stuck in a body that they don't fit in. And there mm -hmm. is, some, I mean, then they have to have multiple surgeries, right, to... Yes. Reverse and correct that if at all possible. Yeah. So it, it ends up falling into kind of the, the transgender realm of things. Um, if a procedure was done and they're like, I honestly don't feel comfortable in this body, they could very well have felt comfortable if they had the, the choice from the beginning um, or to then choose themselves. This is whatever quote unquote sex I want to fall into so I'm going to get this procedure done rather than now I have to backtrack and it's not going to be necessarily usable but more kind of um cosmetic me. yeah it's going to be cosmetic rather than I'm just getting rid of this one organ and enhancing another <clears throat> I heard you use the word choose mm -hmm. so tell me about that use of the word choose versus people saying that sexuality or gender identity, like with the choice of sexuality and things like that, because people argue that that's a choice. So in that term of choose, it's, I am choosing to decide like with the intersex, how I feel most comfortable and showing that. So that even falls into gender itself of how do I want to express myself? How do I want to be seen? How do I feel? Um, I say choice because there's also, there are people who feel very comfortable in how they express gender, but maybe not change physical attributes. Um, so that can be a choice, but there's also this, I mean, yes, the assumption on that point is you choose, you choose your gender, you choose all of this, but at the end of the day, it's not necessarily a choice because you you do what feels most comfortable for you at the end of the day. So if, I guess, some people will use the most stereotypical terms of if you're a masculine man and you're being forced to wear dresses, you're not going to feel comfortable with that because that's not you, but it's easy to kind of connect that if you're in a heteronormative kind of like straight society of, well, 
boys don't wear dresses. Mm -hmm. That is socially there. But at the same time, if you're somebody who doesn't kind of fit into that, where you may be more comfortable with that, then that's going to be your choice of, well, I'm not going to wear that because I'm not comfortable in that. Or I'm going to wear that because I do feel comfortable in that. Um, it's more about our own kind of expression and identity and what kind of aligns to our true selves versus what I just decide that I want to do today. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I want to. Like with sexuality mm -hmm. being a choice, that's something you're born with. Yeah. Yeah. You have that, you know, physical, emotional attraction, connection to somebody. Regardless, that's not something you can force. You can definitely try to force it, but it's not going to end well. And it's not going to end in you feeling like your true self or being happy or content or kind of like that full circle self. So, um, and I almost titled this like, you know, gender on the spectrum or things like that. Tell me how, like, uh, kind of define what that spectrum is as far as gender identity. Oh, there's so many. Um, and that that's, I, I think that's what gets a lot of people stuck. It's like, I hear people all the time. They're like, there's so many options. Why can't you just be like this short amount? Because we're so used to the binary. But gender can be anything from, I identify with no gender, which is kind of what's considered an agender, um, to where there's just no real focus on that. I just kind of go through my day to day. I don't really have an identity or an expression that I fall more into one or the other. Um, all the way to the other side of the spectrum of, I mean, you can be transgender, you can be straight, you can be, you know, very heterosexual in the point of I'm going to be in these bi the binaries of I'm going to see what's masculine versus what's feminine, quote unquote. I mean, that's all social standard anyway. Um, cisgender is identity consistent with assigned sex at birth basically. So like that would, I guess, kind of be the other side of it of these are all these options of how I express and how I identify versus what is in line with what these norms tell me that I have to be or can mm -hmm. be or should be kind of thing. Um, I like that you, so on the point of like, we like things to be on the binary like this or that, or it, to me, it's like, we want, we need to know like exactly mm -hmm. what category this fits in where. <laughs> like, yes. And, and it's like, it's for, for me, it's like, uh, I, this is how I think of it. And maybe, I don't know if this is like some of the training that you get or not, but to me, that's like very primal survival, mm -hmm. right? To like, I need to know if this is safe socially for this pack, for our survival. Like I need to be able to categorize things to know what I mesh with, what I don't, what direction to go, you know, better survival of the fittest type thing. Yeah. So we need to categorize to understand it's very scientific. Um, we have to categorize because if we don't categorize, then it doesn't make sense for us to obtain information, process information. So it is very primal and very much. Innate. A sort of, yeah, you, you, you need to do that. However, categorizing isn't permanent. You know, like it, it's a dual strength. It's a strength. It's a flaw. Like it's, it's got both those sides to it. So that leads to us creating labels, which is why there are so many labels. And I talk about this a lot when I talk with my LGBTQ clients. It's like, they're like, I, I feel lost. I need to have this label. And then later on down the road, they're like, well, I don't like the labels. It has a purpose in the time it has a purpose because we categorize to understand. And then we realize, well, the header that we put on top at the end of the day is not as important as living. So the categorizing is what gets us started, but we have to continue gathering information to not make those snap judgments, to not be like, well, they look this certain way, so this is what they should be or what they must be. It's, I understand that this is my snap understanding of this category, but I don't know anything about this person, so I need to start asking the questions or just be open to see how they express themselves. Um, and that can change the time, right? Like, right. You, okay, so we gather information, we find this identity, and we're like, hmm, That's check, it. check. I feel like that kind of fits me. And then a year or two later, you have some experiences or you gather more information, and then that can change. Yes. Yeah. Um, with anybody on a gender spectrum or not, I mean, you can go through something over a few years and then decide, well, this is what I'm into now, or this is me, because now I've experienced all these other things, or I've you know, tried this, tried that, 
learn that this is what I'm more comfortable doing or this is what I'm more comfortable with. Um, and then it kind of changes over time because we aren't just carbon copy of this is the idea, this is what we do now it's the rest of our lives kind of thing. I love that you made that so relatable because it's like with any, it's like with a job, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, as therapists, we have so many options for what we can do, right? Like you could work in a lot of variety of different settings. You could work in a hospital, you could work an outpatient, you can, you know, mm -hmm. and, and social work, it's even more broad of the amount of things that I could do. And when I first started in school, it was like, oh, I wanted to do this. And then you have experiences and you're like, I never want to do that again. Or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. or I never thought I'd want to do this. And then I tried it and now I love it. So I, I like that it's very relatable in that way because I think it normalizes mm -hmm. gender being on the spectrum and, and ongoing change and choice over time. Right. It takes away that giant blaring light on it because there's this side of we're trying to understand it more, but then there's so much extra focus on it, which is cost, casting a negative light. Cause it's like, well, why is all this focus on it? Why does it have to be this way? And it's like, cause we're trying, we're still trying, we're in this process of still trying to understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, pride riots and stuff. That's not that long ago, you know, like it, it's still getting figured out, you know, and, and now there's like this giant boom of everybody, like coming to terms and creating these new terms to categorize and make sense and understand that, it just it dates back way farther than that but now we're starting to actually put the language there because without the language we can't we can't really understand whatever that language is like we need that to be able to interact and understand and process and validate people's experiences that too yes because i think and this is some i know we're like off topic of our bullet points but it's something that irks me every time I hear it from older generations, and I get it. There's so many differences there, but it's like none of this, none of these terms were around. You know, they're just making this up type thing. Like, what is your um, reasoning or understanding for why it's more now than in the past? I mean, to a point, they are making it up because they're trying to identify. They're trying to understand and with any label category you had to make it up at some point mm -hmm. we're just in that cusp of we you know we weren't there when male female binary when all of that was decided it was made up then too mm -hmm. you know but it makes sense based on you know data, data like research stuff and and this as well but we're putting a name to it now you know it's like yes there's a lot of different names and some are kind of just a smidge off but that's what makes it validating mm -hmm. um, to a certain point i don't know maybe we'll get to a point where we don't need so many various labels or names because it just makes sense like just like you know like even however long ago like you would be a girl you'd be a tomboy you'd be a boy like that was still like a term to show mm -hmm. like well you're kind of in the middle of this binary understanding of social things but it was made for that purpose for an understanding yeah like we've always been there yeah. <laughs> existing on these specs yes. i think is the point but i think people have a hard time believing or understanding that because it wasn't as socially acceptable to talk about it was we didn't have media and social media as we do now and right. ability to compare ourselves and right and even before they're like before like a giant boom i guess whenever this happened whenever more and more terms came out and i feel like it's been more recently because there's been i'm just gonna blame tiktok i mean like there's just an well, influx pandemic of, i think pandemic and there's an influx of people being able to talk and share stuff that wasn't as prevalent as before mm -hmm. but even before that like just even in the lgbt community like it was more focused on sexuality but there would be subsets of like lesbians and you know subsets of gay men or subsets of that that like this is what i identify as i'm not lesbian i'm a lipstick lesbian i'm a butch lesbian you know i'm a bear and this that and the other like mm -hmm. there's always been additional labels it's just on the forefront now thank you for going off on that tangent with me because <laughs> i know it always gets brought up so i yeah. want to make sure i addressed it okay yeah. so i don't know if we got there i asked you about it and then we squirreled but the three ways to look at gender so there is this website called the genderspectrum.org that um, I look at sometimes. Um, they try to categorize basically gender into three dimensions. Um, and I'm going to attach it to the gender unicorn, which is used very often. Google it, the gender unicorn. It pops up right away. It's a cute little cartoon of a purple unicorn. It's fantastic. 
Um, if, if you're feeling feisty, you can also type in the, the gingerbread. I forget, it's not gingerbread man, it's gingerbread something, but that's another version of it. Um, so they separate it into body, identity, and social dimensions. So the body is kind of like what we're talking about. It's it's our experience with our own body. So there's this gendered view from society of how we interact with others, how we're supposed to perceive. But at the end of the day, that body dimension is how we are in our body. So with that, that's our expression. Are we feminine, masculine, somewhere in the middle? Um, that expression is going to be how we dress, how we look, how we present ourselves to society, basically. Um, that then comes into sometimes with like being non-binary, which will also fall into identity, which is going to come in next. It's like, you know, non-binary is a gender outside of the norm. So maybe I'm both masculine and feminine. Maybe today I'm more this side. Maybe today I'm more that side or the agender where I'm, you know, or asexual or what have you. Like I'm not in that kind of code right there. The identity part is our internal sense of self. So body is how we experience our body, but it's more of a physical kind of outward. Identity is internal sense of self. So that's where it kind of falls into the need of understanding. Like how do we categorize our own understandings, our own beliefs of who we are? Uh, female, woman, girl, male, other genders, um, transgender, cisgender, agender, non-binary. Um, Native American Indians had two spirits. So that was, you know, something way back in their teachings of a person who embodies both masculine and feminine spirits. That is very in their culture. I don't know when that first started being written about, but that's... Mm -hmm. That's how they categorized it. Or that's how they categorized it, two mm -hmm. spirits. And that was just, it is what it is, two spirit. It wasn't more one or the other. It was just, mm -hmm. you embody both. Um, so it's based on the individual how they feel so there's no wrong answer you know it, it's wherever you are that day is where you are um the third one is a social dimension so that's how we present our gender so that falls more also into the expression how do we present that to society how do we present it to the world how do they perceive it how do they interact with us um or expectations how do they try to shape it change it that's a good just, note to leave off on i was just gonna say and as you're explaining these three categories i'm imagining Mm -hmm. A little person trying to make it through the world. Yeah. In all the different areas of life that are just, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, you got to muddle through it all. It's like, right. Test like, test. yeah. Your school, your social environment, <laughs> um, your parents, faith, religious mm -hmm. upbringing, so many different areas you're like trying to navigate and understand but is it safe for you too are you gonna right. I mean we're therapists right so I know you see people and this is probably what you talk about all the time is it safe for them to explore is it safe mm -hmm. for them to express is it safe for them to talk about and figure out who they are right and sometimes it is sometimes it isn't it that's still up in the air um talked about more so there's more of an opening but it's there's still places and there's still times that it's not safe mm -hmm. um and then the the gender unicorn goes farther into talking about, you know, the expression of how you communicate your mannerisms or closing your speech your behaviors. Um, and then it falls into, you know, sex assigned to birth. So it shows kind of what that is, female, male, other intersex. Um, and then it goes into physical and emotional attraction is another part where like it just kind of shows like this is just about attraction. So what you're attracted to, what you connect with. Um, so that's where the sexualities come in, right? Uh, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, attracted to male and female, pansexual, attracted to all genders, all sexualities, asexual, little or no sexual attraction to others. Um, where you fall on that physical as well as emotional, because we also think about that too. Sexuality means sex, which means genitals, right? Mm -hmm. But it's about attraction physically and emotionally. So it kind of breaks that down as well. There's so many moving parts. Yes. And so yes. like then you think about as you're trying to navigate relationships with people, whether it's sexual or not, mm -hmm. you know, are they, again, are, is it safe for me to express this and present who I am? Even mm -hmm. in the workplace, I'm just thinking about people I've engaged with, clients, 
in the workplace is it you know this is who i've had clients that you know express themselves one way at home and another way at work because they don't feel they feel like they might get fired or mm -hmm. you know something might happen um yeah. and i'm not sure i know this is a tangent that i didn't prepare you for but as far yeah. as you know as far as like civil rights or um things like that i believe ohio is not a state where lgbtq uh, like workplace i can't remember i was in a training one time equal opportunity yeah i believe I don't, it's covered under that i think it changed i think it was and now it isn't okay. but i don't remember um there was a lot that was going on i would have to check so if you have people that comment on your podcast i bet you they'll let us know <laughs> <laughs> but it, it i, I want to say it changed but i know that there's some places that yeah that is still an actual kind of risk of am i going to be am I going to lose my job because of this when it in a sense has nothing to do with your work in, at all as long as you're not flaunting or interfering with work or doing things that aren't work related or letting it come away that like it, it yeah they can't just say hey I perceive you to be a male and you're wearing a dress today and I don't like how that looks right right um, it has nothing to do with work it's more personal yeah some jobs absolutely have a look or an observable piece that they have, but generally those are written into the contracts where I'm sure that is a discriminatory, discriminative kind of thing as well. But there are definitely ones that are like, you have to have this certain look, which is still, you know, that's a whole other tangent of things mm -hmm. outside of gender and sex, just in general. Um, it wouldn't be our podcast if we didn't go off on tangents. So it's okay. Well, it's true. Yeah um so yeah like gender is very diverse so there's it's an umbrella term so even there's this thing called this lgbt umbrella that actually is a little umbrella and it separates it because that's where it gets confusing as well because lgb is sexualities t is gender mm -hmm. so they're separate but it's still kind of this umbrella thing of we're just trying to kind of understand who we are mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then you have all the other letters after that that i can't keep track of <laughs> alphabet um it's interesting too because I always wonder am I I know the next bullet is like how do we I don't I know we got to wrap this one up but I know the next one mm -hmm. is like how to be more affirming but I always wonder like when I put LGBTQ plus am I is that affirming enough like are the people that are in the plus do they feel <laughs> validated when they see that or you know it, and I'm sure there's no right or wrong answer but I think to a point there has to be a level of inclusion of this is I think and that's I think that's the purpose of the plus quite honestly at least that's my take on it is we can't say every single thing but this one has already been established we're going to add the plus to it to be like you're still a part of it but I guess maybe if you're working more with somebody you don't focus on just being like LGBTQ plus it's you know, transgender, your gender non-conforming, non-binary. Um, you know, this is kind of how you present. So I'm going to add that maybe into my title of things, or we're just going to mm -hmm. focus on, you know. What one you identify with. Yeah, yeah. Because that would be a very, that would take up all of your time, is to just list them all out. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's it's trying to be as and inclusive, inclusive as possible without... There has to be a level of I'm not leaving people out. I'm just trying to be as broad as possible because to a point we do have to be broad. Mm -hmm. But it's when you get more intimate that you become specific. So how can we be more affirming in our everyday life? So I know therapists, mental health professionals have been obviously getting more training provided on this because it's related to the work we do. Yet it's related to the work everybody does, I feel like. Um, so it's interesting. I have a family member who um, is a gay male and cisgender male. And he had like looked at my website and saw things and saw like how our pronouns were on there. And he didn't he didn't even really understand, mm -hmm. like even just, you know, being a part of the gay community, didn't understand the importance of pronouns. And then mm -hmm. he went to a new doctor's office and on the paperwork, they asked him his pronouns. And he like had to tell me all about that. And he's like, hey, that's cool. Like I saw that, you know, you asked that and then they asked that, like, tell me about this. Like, is this a new thing? Um, and you know, you don't really see it very many places. And when you do say, when I see it, I'm like, 
yes, like, yeah. good job. Like, you make mm -hmm. me happy. You're in affirming place. So how can everyday people, whether they're at work, they're a cashier, they're, you know, whatever, whatever you're doing in your everyday life, if you're just encountering someone in line shopping, how can you be more affirming? So the biggest thing I kind of look at is to be affirming is you need to have some understanding of the differences between gender, sexuality, sex, but you can't be an expert. Don't try to be an expert because then you fall into that. You're, you're falling back into categorizing and judging. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you do not know somebody's identity and expression until they explain it to you. So being, you know, it's back to that of I can categorize to start to understand, but I have to be able to ask the question. So not assuming, um, uninvasive questions. So like, yeah, what are your pronouns? Um, do you have, you know, a preference of how I address you? Like, is that something like, you know, you can, who, what's your name? What's your, what's your pronoun? Kind of all that kind of stuff. Um, how would you describe yourself? Um, you leave it in their hands. It's it's an open-ended question, not a yes-no question, right? Mm -hmm. So you learn about the person, not drilling them, not being like, oh, so, you know, who do you like or who are you attracted to or, you know, what kind of organs do you have? Like, you mm -hmm. you wouldn't ask that, but basically, like, what you're asking is that kind of... Oh, people like, automatically assume already for my newborn, they're like, oh, he's going to be a lady killer. Oh, yes. you know, he's a flirt. He's going to yes. get all the ladies. Oh, he likes... And I'm like... I, we don't know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. And then there's there's that unaffirming side of, so having no knowledge of gender, no understanding, and it's just you're going with whatever you already know, um, assuming genitalia ter determines gender, right? We've already kind of hit that. But you also fast. don't know what their genitalia is. Right. Like, but standing there's always... in line at the grocery store, you're just, uh, you're dressing like a male and you yep. have a beard. So yep. I'm going to assume you have a penis. Yeah. Not yeah. the fact that you're dressing like a male, you may have PCOS and you just have facial hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so assuming there's only a binary and assuming that non-binary sex gender is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. That was definitely, how long ago was that in the DSM for a mental illness? I don't remember. I try not to think about it. Um, so humble just, yourself and do your own work. Yeah. And... With the, the names and the pronouns, so issue that went through not too long ago, I remember listening, uh, she might have been on your podcast, I don't remember who the trainer was, I'd have to look, um, talking about why preferred pronouns is outdated and wrong, mm -hmm. so you ask for chosen, chosen. or mm -hmm. what are your pronouns, because preferred basically tells somebody that it's unimportant, it's up to that person what they decide to call you. Um, so it, it gives that, that back, you know, you will assume by social norms that you're going to be identified as Mr. Mrs. Ms. Whatever, that kind of stuff. But even then, like people might get upset if you're, I, you know, somebody asks, says that you're a miss, but you're actually a Mrs. or vice mm -hmm. versa. Like even just that simple one, like, but yeah, all into pronouns kind of thing. Yeah. What is your chosen name? To, yeah. 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 It, it's not an option. Mm -hmm. Um, with other like even in the the health field or counseling um i fall heavily on the national lgbt health education center mostly hospital doctor's office based but it breaks it down it's like ways like recommend they have recommended policies and they have pamphlets for providers as well as clients patients mm -hmm. um so policies are like utilizing gender expression identity terms for even employees having non-discrimination policies. Um, the personal records of the person should have chosen names and pronouns. There's a limitation, of course, if you're, say, dealing with insurance, you have to use legal kind of names and such. But like in the agency that I work for, I always place in there and we're finding ways to place in there. Like this is what's accurate, but this is what legally we have to do for insurance. Um, but even uh, making that possible for employees and families. Mm -hmm. um, offering gender neutral bathrooms like small things that are actually big things that they're, they're considered small because we don't think about it because we overlook all that stuff yeah you have um, to think about it as if you're walking in their shoes right you know like things that I didn't think about until I became a mom like how important it is to be somewhere that has a changing table in the bathroom yeah 
And so, I mean, something as simple as you go to the bathroom how many times a day, and if you have to go into a bathroom and look at a sign or walk into somewhere to do one of the most private personal things that we do, and it's automatically uncomfortable, mm -hmm. are you going to want to come back to that place? Right. Whether it's Target or the doctor's office or... Right. And the yeah. issue seems to be like, I, what was it? It was a, an argument that people are going into the other rooms to be X, Y, or Z, right? Oh, but that, um, like predatory. Yeah, but that again is falling onto, I'm assuming what your intentions are with your genitalia, not the fact that you need to go to the bathroom. Because how often do people associate sex with peeing? I guess unless it's a fetish, I don't know. But like, that also kind of falls in like all you're you're going into the use of the bathroom mm -hmm. yes there's that argument of they're not actually using the bathroom they're going in but at the same time it's like all i'm trying to do is this so gender neutral it kind of pulls away that ability of being judged as well mm -hmm. a lot of people normal do, biological function <laughs> yeah i think in the health education one they said specifically gender neutral single stall bathrooms um I think, which a lot of places are like that anyway now, like you can either have like the galley stalls or just a single one, because then it really, it has no purpose. All it is, is a room with a toilet in it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what they suggest. I think safety wise, that would, I mean, if we're talking about basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs and safety and security, if I'm going into a bathroom and I might have to encounter other people in there that don't accept how I look right. or whatever versus me just going into a room being able to do what I need to do and get out right and at the same time it doesn't matter how people dress and express themselves if there's say they're all quote unquote the same sex you're not going to think twice if you're all in a stall going like different stalls going to the bathroom you're mm -hmm. going to second guess it if they don't fit in that norm because they're not dressing particularly feminine but right you're just going to the bathroom and leaving you generally will keep your head down and go do your business and leave Again, I go back to the beginning. It's very strange to me that people are so <laughs> inquisitive about what is going on in people's pants and what is going on in people's bedrooms with what's in their pants. Yeah, it's it's the only physical evidence, I guess, right now that people can latch onto because we search for physical evidence. Mm -hmm. I can not necessarily put my hands on it because that would be inappropriate, but like evidence I can to support it's. it's evidence that I can actually hold and understand mm -hmm. because that is the only physical visual as well as just kind of embodied marker that we have versus this I'm going to allow you to tell me what your life is like instead of me assuming absolutely yeah and I think you have to like you said you have to do the work and you have to be committed I mean there's people that aren't going to be willing to they're just they are who they are and they're not going to change their minds and maybe one day they will, but you have to just be willing to constantly do that work. And I, I told you the example, but I was in line at Starbucks the other day and there was, I think I called them a woman and I don't know, but there was a person holding their child mm -hmm. <laughs> and the child's little sock was falling off. And I was about to say, oh, and I think I might've said her because the way the baby was dressed. And I said, hold on. I don't know that baby's gender. <laughs> right. And I it's always going to be, it's always going to be a part and yeah. it's going to be a snap judgment for a very long time, but it's acknowledging it. And a lot of times, even like with pronouns or I have clients that are like really upset because they were misnamed or misgendered. It's like, it's our job to fix it, not theirs. Mm -hmm. Their job is to kind of show us that, but they tend to become the educators when we need to do the educating and then connect it to that person. Yeah, they're, like already, you, they're already going you, through it. They don't need to right, do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Because other, I mean, it, it's just like you wouldn't ask somebody to tell. I wouldn't ask you to teach me about biophysics unless you actually had a degree. Just like, yes, they're in this realm of gender and LGBT, but I'm not going to ask you to know everything. I'm going well, to put that burden on them to explain. Right. Themselves. It, right. And it, it relates to me like I, I wouldn't ask a black person to right. uh, explain systemic racism to me. Right. There's definitely an insight and an understanding, but all they need to know is themselves and right. you need to do the rest of the work. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, any last minute, like, we always ask, is there a last minute 
mantra or anything else that's on your mind for the category or anything like that that you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, don't feel don't don't be hard on yourself if and when you mess something up, especially if you're going through learning that maybe somebody is changing their gender or adjusting and finding it out. You are going to fall into your snap judgments, but you have to acknowledge it and say it apologize or say hey I messed up here this is instead of just ignoring it and hoping that it goes away because that hits somebody harder because then it's like you're overlooking it so you're talking with someone um maybe you've known them for a long time and they've recently transitioned male to female um and then you are going through talking about something and either used previous name or he pronouns instead of just being like well i'm just going to keep going and keep talking and i'm going to switch it to her stop and be like you know what i said the wrong one i'm extremely sorry this is what i meant because it takes everybody a long time to get used to those kinds of things rather than just steamrolling through because then the person is stuck like now what do i do Mm -hmm. you know it's like i'm acknowledging it i'm putting it down i'm moving forward because i'm not just gonna steamroll it and keep going yes the important is to continue kind of practicing that but you at least want to acknowledge that to that person because it is it's a huge thing absolutely and it's like an it's a natural especially if you've known someone that long you just right naturally spew that off right or or the assumption that you know you look this way so this is the pronoun i'm going to use and now i'm stuck thinking that i'm going to stop and acknowledge it that i made a mistake that that was incorrect you know just like you know you called somebody joe instead of richard Mm -hmm. sorry that's not your name you know like and then you move on rather than just pretending like it never happened I appreciate that for sure I've uh, heard in the past so that's a a different perspective because in the past I've been told don't make a big deal out of it like don't overly apologize just Mm -hmm. stop and like repeat what you said with the correct terminology and then move on yeah don't overly apologize it's just hey I'm sorry I'm acknowledging it. Like it doesn't yeah. have to be this huge thing. It's just this is. We don't want to make them feel like a burden for yeah. you having to like second right. change. Yeah. Because it's it's just a, a random thing. Like just like if I was saying, you know, I was talking to you and I called you another name, I'd be like, wait, that's not your name. Because then you're sitting there like, do they even know my name? Do they know who <laughs> I am? And then you're thinking about that. Like if it's somebody that you never met before, it's like, sorry, Amanda. Anyway, let's move on. Like. Mm-hmm. When I say apologize, I don't mean profusely. I'm just like, hey, sorry, like an acknowledgement kind of thing. And yeah. not feeling and beating yourself up for messing it up if and when you do, because you're getting used to it as well. And you might, <laughs> and it can change too, right? It mm-hmm. can change again, right? Yes. So like I've had multiple, I'm sorry, that was our wrap up and now I'm opening something back up. But I've had multiple yeah. clients that have gone, you know, they've at birth by others, she been she then Mm -hmm. uh, I think I want to be he right now I think that feels like it fits right for me actually I'm I'm they them oh Mm -hmm. I'm just a human at this point and it's like you know okay well and there's pressure you need to know like if you don't know then then it must not be right but you have to experience it and I think that's part of it too where we have ourselves we have to categorize so if I'm not this then I must be the other one because I'm immediately used to the binary but that doesn't fit Because I've had clients, too, that are like, I feel like I'm just jumping around and people are going to think that I'm just choosing whatever. It's like, no, you're trying to figure it out. But we have a pressure to label. You're in the dressing room of pronouns and you're just trying to figure out what one fits the best. You're You're like, well, this kind of fits, but there's this weird little like flap here. And I guess it could be okay. I guess I could deal with it. But like, Mm -hmm. this one's kind of nice, but it's a little tight. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the the like they them are people who go by like he they, right? Today I'm more on this flap, tomorrow I'm on or halfway through the day. You know, I've I've heard that too. It's just like so when I do like my gender affirming surgery letters, if they have multiple pronouns, I will put that through. I won't just stick to one. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that too. It's like just because someone has two, if you are more comfortable with the one because it makes more sense, you still need to use the other. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that for sure. Because, yeah, it doesn't mean that I, just because I say she, they, oh, okay, you look like a she and she is okay, so I'm always going to use she. Because it's easier for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it just makes sense, yeah. Good stuff, Jenna. Good stuff, Amanda.
Thanks for coming back. Um, yeah. You're welcome back anytime. Um, we will make sure that we link those couple websites that Jenna listed off um, and I'll just like asterisk and that you can Google the gender unicorn and the gender gingerbread person. <laughs> yes, that's what it is, gingerbread person. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, comments, or if you know anything about equal opportunity or things like that in different states, we would be interested in learning that from a legal side um, and civil rights side. So um, next week, we are going to, speaking of TikTok, we are going to be having Dr. Kristen Casey from TikTok. Um, I, for the life of me, didn't prepare because I have mom brain and I can't remember what her TikTok name is, but she's very famous <laughs> on TikTok um, and she's going to be coming to talk a lot about anxiety and insomnia and I will be hosting her. So make sure that you tune in next week and we will see you then. Bye.